and Ian. You're from the Department of Conservation Mahanui Office. That's right, yeah. And today we're going to talk about the Kaitoriti Spit and Birdlings Flat. So what do you guys do out there? Um, we do a variety of things that ranges from um, weed control, um, monitoring of endangered plants, um, some pest control, um, monitoring for lizards out there, geckos and skinks, um, fencing right. and keep stock off um, certain areas, um, liaising with the public out there, um, including people who use ATVs and um, four-wheel drive vehicles on the beach and in the dunes sometimes. Yeah. So where is this area and why is it important? Um, well, most people probably know um, Birdlings Flat before Kaiduriti Spit. And Birdlings Flat's about 50 k's south of Christchurch on the um, Christchurch Akaro Highway. And Kaiduriti Spit is actually, a, um, it's like a big finger of gravel that um, extends out from Birdlings Flat heading west to the Alps towards Taumutu. Okay. Um, and it basically just blocks off Lake Ellesmere, Te Waihora, um, from the sea. So it's about 28, 30 k's long, just a big mass of gravel. Is mm. it quite a unique area? Yeah, it is. Um, it's got the largest um, population of um, Pinau or Pikau, if you're okay. um, from the yep. South Island. Yep. Um, that's um, a sand binding sedge. It's a native sedge which around the rest of the country it's um, been severely degraded, right. so there's not a lot of it left. And yep. when you see 30 k's of orange Pinau, it's pretty spectacular because yeah. it's just something you don't see a great deal in, yeah. around New Zealand on that scale anymore. Yeah, there's populations down in Stewart Island and other, and other places, but out on the spit it's, um, it's generally been untouched. Right, yeah. so it's pretty important to keep it that way. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's a really representative um, um, part of the vegetation that was quite common around parts of New Zealand. Yep. Um, having said that, the spit is only supposed to be about 6,000 years old. Right. Um, it was formed, or it is being formed, uh, as we speak, um, by gravel to get washed down the Rakaia okay. and then um, piled up on the beach. So at the eastern end, it's about three k's wide, and at the western end, towards Taumutu, it's uh, less than 100 metres wide. Right. So it's quite a, um, it's a very dynamic environment, and anyone who lives out there or goes out there will can attest to that. Yeah. Mm. And is there a community of people that live out there? Yeah, there's um, there's a population of um, permanents who live out at, at the at Birdlings. Right. Um, Maori occupied the site um, you know, well before Europeans, so there's always been a history of um, a lot of eeling out there, and the spit itself was um, a very important stopover for um, food gathering okay. and um, campsites. Um, Birdlings Flat, I don't know what the population is out there, but there's also people who you know, have batches out there, but right. um, yeah. with the appeal of living by the sea, um, yeah. there's, there's more people that have started to live out there and some houses are getting relocated out there. Okay, and um, that all impacts the environment as well, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not to everyone's um, liking out there. It's yeah. a pretty unique place and it's pretty harsh and you've, um, I think you've got to be pretty, pretty hardy to live out there yeah. in a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah. In terms of the area, what and the main concerns for the Department of Conservation? Is it mainly weed control? Um, no, not, not just weed control. Um, I guess the the whole area is under threat from um, all sorts of pests, predators mm -hmm. and weed pests. Um, I largely deal with weeds, so that's my main area. But um, for instance, the, um, the catapo spider, oh, okay. which um, is a very interesting spider to, to sort of see in, yeah. in the wild, and you can see them out there. Um, Don't know if I'd want to. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're quite a small spider. They're not like the the. Um, when I was a kid, I remember when we first came to New Zealand. I, um, you know, you got those resin spiders. Yes. They yeah. were sort of set in resin, yeah. and well, this spider was about that big, okay. and um, it had a big sort of um, red mark painted yeah. on the abdomen. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I thought it was a catapo for years until yeah. I actually <laughs> saw one. Um, but no, the, the catapo is quite small. Okay. Um, and that's a, a natural habitat for them out on the Yeah, it is. Stage. And um, so, for instance, we're just talking about um, weed control. Well, the the catapo seems to be affected quite majorly by the yellow tree lupin, okay. which is 
been spreading uh, out on the spit for quite some time now, and it's you know it's common around many parts of New Zealand. Um, but the other people in our area office, they they do monitoring of the, of the catapo, and um, they've found that in the tree lupin, it just it, di it disappears. When the tree lupin's gone, um, it comes back quite happily. Um, around the pinau, it's uh, pikau, it's it's quite common. Um, at, at times, you know, if you if you know the right places to look, you'll actually see quite a few spiders. That's yeah. Mm. So you mentioned the tree lupin. What other weeds in that area are particularly problem? Well, on on the spit itself, um, there's the old sort of hardies there, like gorse and broom. Because right. because most of the native vegetation, it's not woody, um, it's all low growing. So if you get anything to any height, like yeah. gorse or broom, well, that shades it out. So right. um, we actively control gorse and broom. Um, there's the tree lupin. Um, there are a number of garden escapes. Some are more widespread than others. Um, one that is getting away particularly. Um, in the last few years is, is a plant called gazania, which is just a you know fantastic showy um, plant that just loves okay. hot places. Is that a shrub? Or? Uh, it's like it's it's like a um, well in some places it would be classified as a um, perennial, but it's quite a, a hardy um, small shrub that okay. um, can sp spread by wind blowing seed. Yeah. And people have it around their gardens a lot, you know, because it's you don't need to water it. It's hardy, right. looks yeah. great, yeah. but it sort of gets away. But um, there's a few shrubby plants that get away. Um, caro, which um, is a native, yeah. but it's um, it's not native to Canterbury, and okay. um, some people have a bit of trouble getting their head around that. And yeah. um, but it's an excellent shelter plant out there. Um, fantastic shelter plant, and you know because it's extremely windy out there, yeah, you know you, you need you need a bit of shelter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, but that's. Um, it produces a lot of seed and it gets away very easily in the gravels. Right. So while it hasn't actually got away onto a lot of the reserve land, it's um, it has escaped into um, some covenanted land okay. um, that's got nothing to do with you know public conservation land. It's um, private covenant yeah. conservation covenant. It's got away there and it overtops a lot of the um, local endemic plants. Endemic, you know, being um, Plants that are native to a given yeah. area, and, yeah. I, and I, I suppose um, I don't know. It's not just because I'm an, out, an outsider; I'm not from here. But I think it's really important <laughs> that we um, we celebrate, you know, the vegetation Absolutely. that's around Canterbury. You know, yes. yeah, yeah. I like the Australians that they have their, um, you know, they have their state flower. You know, I think yeah. it'd be great if Canterbury had a, you know, um, a pro flower. Well, all, all provinces, you know, yeah. just. So what would be the state? Uh, <laughs> well, I quite like tussocks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that might not be quite fla flash enough. Um, um, oh, look, there's prostrate broom. There's brooms out there that you know you, you've got to sort of really get down and have a look at. Yeah. Um, but they've got a gorgeous flower. You know, if yeah. more people knew about them, I'm sure yeah. they'd want them in their garden. And are they you know? out on the spit? They're out on the spit. They're at um, Birling's flat. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a gorgeous, gorgeous little flower. Just a normal broom flower, but yeah. quite small, okay. um, purple and white. Yeah. So, you know, people say that native flowers don't have any colour. You know, they've just got to, got to look a bit closer. Get, yeah, look sometimes look a bit closer. Yeah. 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 And if those native plants are being threatened by the weeds, then that sort of impacts all the insects and bird life, and it has quite a far-reaching effect, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It's um, and in the case of the tree lupin, because the tree lupin is such a vigorous colonizer and because it grows so quickly and um, displaces well for a start the pinau, pikau and um, the catapo yeah. um, that's that's happened in a very very short period space of time yeah. we've had some research um, and monitoring done from the geography department of the Otago University mm -hmm. and um, with the aid of aerial photographs and surveys they did out there um, in the last few years, contracted to the department, um, they've come up with the conclusion that by 2025, the entire spit would be covered with tree lupin if nothing was done yeah. about it. So, and that you know, people say, well, what you know, well, people say, well, you know, big deal. Well, it, it is a big deal because the area, you know, it's not like the rest. It's not like huge parts of the New Zealand coast where you know tree lupin has taken over yeah. and displaced lots of vegetation. Marum grass is also been a problem and um, that was being controlled long before I started work out there um, by some people in our office. Um, and is that a garden escape? No, it was used as a sand binder um, oh, okay. 
you know, because like that, that's the thing out there. I mean, there's people have used the land for different reasons, and it was um, quite possibly um, planted by farmers to stabilise the dunes, because right. you know if you've got sort of blowouts in your dunes and um, blown all through onto your farmland, well, it sort of stuffs the stuffs the, um, the fleece on the sheep, you know. So okay. you know, there's lots of good reasons why it was planted in the first place, but it, it is very aggressive, and it will or has in other parts of the country. You just go to Brighton Beach and you don't see a lot of pico out there, um, but there's lots of marram grass. Um, pine trees, okay. they were planted as shelter, which yeah. you know you need the shelter, but they've altered, they've altered the, um, the shape and the movement of sand on the dunes, yeah. and that in effect, that also has a downstream effect on how the pico grows or doesn't grow, because um, it, it prefers mobile dunes. Right. Um, dunes that are always being built up with sand, um, but if, if you stop that growth of, um, if you stop that movement of sand, then the marram grass can sort of take over on the more benign sort of the uh, flat dunes, and that's that's happened quite a bit out there. Um, I could go on and on, but there's a <laughs> ice plant, um, you know, it's gorgeous. The the exotic ice plant, the South African ice plant, has got gorgeous big flowers. Um, I'm not I'm not really sure how that seed gets spread, but that's um, that quickly forms huge mats, which will, you know, completely um, cover a lot of the prostrate native shrubs out there. Um, we prostrate um, caprosmas, um, raulias, the oh, it's the beach version of the um, vegetable sheep you see in the uh, in the in, in the mountains. Yeah, um, similar sort of harsh climate of extremes. Um, gets pretty cold in the winter and uh, you know very hot in the in the summer. Um, a new one we've been working on, um, purple ground salt, that's um, a daisy that's got a seed head that just sort of takes off. So that's carried by the wind? Carried by the wind, yep. or um, sometimes you know, it could be dock staff, you know, on the on the boots or gaiters yeah, or, yeah. you know, you can't, you yeah. can't sort of or trampers, blame gardeners anything, all the time. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. So what about the local community there? Are they interested in weed control? What do they think about it? Um, well, you know, you, if you sort of start making noises about, um, oh, these plants are bad and, you know, these plants are better, then yeah. that sometimes um, can alienate <coughs> people a wee bit. Um, so you've got to be quite um, wary of that. And like I say, coming from a horticultural sort of gardening background, I've, um, I like to think I've got a reasonable appreciation of, of plants anyway, and I can like to think that I can see people's point of, yeah. point of view. Yeah, um, so both sides. Yeah, some yeah. people are some people are very supportive. Um, some maybe not so much, and some people maybe a bit indifferent. But um, um, I suppose to me, a, a lot of people were attracted by the place because um, well, it, it is quite sort of um, on one level, it is quite sort of bare and mm. stark, yeah. and people get a, people are attracted to that, and yeah. they're they're attracted to that because. Um, there aren't sort of, there's not a dense sort of um, planting of pines all over the spit. You know, if that was full of pines like at Spencer Park, I'd suggest that people might feel quite differently about quite it. Quite a different place. You wouldn't get the views, yeah. and, you know, the native vegetation's not woody, so it's, you, you, you know, you can see for miles out yeah. there. Um, so, yeah, some people are really, um, really supportive. Um, but the, the thing is, is, you know, when you're trying to um, show your concerns about weeds with people as well, talk to people first and not just sort of roar in and, so you can't have this, you can't have that. Um, yeah, doesn't yeah. doesn't go down too well. Yeah. Are there community <laughs> groups who have sort of come together to try and work in this area to maintain the native? Park? Yeah, yeah, there is. There's, um, there's a core group out there who um, do work locally. Um, there's there's an area of land out the front of the um, the village that's that's pretty weedy. Um, yeah. Part of that um, has been controlled to to some degree. And then there's this covenant out there, which um, is sort of just at the back of the uh, the back of the village, and that's a shrubland covenant um, with lots of sort of small leaf shrubs mm-hmm. that are quite specific to Canterbury, especially, and other other parts of the east coast of New Zealand. And, um, and there's a lot of work being done in there by um, a group of volunteers, some who live on the peninsula, some who live in town, and some who live at, live at Birdlings. Okay. Yeah. And that's great habitat. Those shrublands are great habitat for the uh, the, uh, the geckos and the okay. lizards that are out, the skinks that are out there. Yeah. Mm. So, do you feel that you're making progress in this area? 
yeah, well, as soon as you start talking to people, you know, they um, that, that's progress. You know, whether they agree with you or not um, is another matter. But talking to people is the key, you know, to, to sort of concerns or not just concerns, but just um, getting people to um, um, see and appreciate the, um, the local plants because they are quite, um, they're not really in your face, you yes. know, yeah. a lot of them. Yeah. yeah. Quite subtle. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And you do have to lie down on the ground a bit yeah. to <laughs> get so, into the flowers. Yeah. What are the main problems that you sort of encounter? So you might, I guess, maybe community members that don't understand the project or controlling um, garden escapes. Well, I suppose like the the public conservation land that we that we work on is actually some distance from the um, the village of Burlings Flat. Okay. Um, and you know we don't hesitate to remove plants on conservation land that um, may have escaped from the village or from other sources, you know, from our boots. Yes. <laughs> you know, um, so that in itself isn't a problem. But you know, you do get into conversations with people sometimes on the beach. You know, if you're on your ATV and they're on their ATV, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, they say, well, you know, why are you doing that? And um, you try and explain to them that it's with weeds. It's always a long term. It's always a long-term thing. You've got to look way, way into the future. Yeah. Um, you know, the tree looping, um, you know, 20 years ago wasn't that big a deal. You know, well, 20 years ago is not that long ago. Um, yeah, and there's the, the plants that are just establishing out there that you know you need to get on now so that in the long term you're actually saving money as well because money's, money's pretty tight. Um, so you've uh, you've just got to try and be as efficient as you can and. Um, we possibly sometimes don't get out there as much as we'd like, but there's a lot of other sites to go to, um, and you just do your best and try and get the help from um, from local people. Mm. Yeah. yeah. What's the environment like to actually work out there on the split? Um, in the summer, it's it's very hot. Yeah. Um, we do um, we actually do a lot of the work in winter and s through spring and early summer. Um, in terms of weed control, um, yeah, it's very hot. Doesn't doesn't seem to rain a great deal. Sometimes blows yeah. majorly. Um, and there's a there's a building flat weather station that I saw recently. So that's pretty handy. I mean, you can always ring someone up and say what to do out there because it can quite often be different out there yeah. than in town. Like it'll be blowing northeastern town, or it'll be a wee southerly blowing at the blowing at the beach. Yeah. Um, winter, um, yeah, I've seen frost out there. Um, Pretty pretty cold out there in winter, or even this time of the year actually. In a, in a southerly, that one that blew up the other day, we had some people working out there on um, on skinks, and they said it was pretty chilly out there. I so, mm. especially cold. Yeah. Yeah. So, what are the future challenges of that site? Are there things that you can see now that you know, like the yellow lupin, wasn't so huge 20 years ago, but might be a big Well, the lupins, the lupins, um, the lupins, probably one of the biggest challenges really because um, because the scale of the control um, it's it's got to the stage where it's aerial control like we've um, sprayed we've had a couple of areas sprayed with a, with a helicopter okay. there's also been a lot of areas done um, with ground control that's um, spraying with ATV spraying with um, spray units mounted on trucks but there's also been um, you know pulling of plants as well yep. um, smaller plants um, volunteer days out there and the seed source is pretty huge and the area is pretty big too so um, I, I think the lupin is, is, is one of the bigger challenges but at the same time you in putting more effort into the lupin work you sometimes you've got to be careful you don't um, you don't sort of fall back on some, the, on, on some of the on, yeah. on some of the other uh, well weeds in particular that we're, we're dealing with um, yeah. it's good not to uh, to forget the to stop, you've got to look at the bigger picture, you know. Um, yeah. And you know, it's, there's this thing, interesting things we've we've learned. Um, um, this with, with the with the spraying of herbicide on that, that sort of large scale, um, we um, did some trials and found that um, a problem with um, toxicity to insects was um, was not the herbicide itself, but um, the penetrant that's added to improve the, the, the kill yeah. um, so with, 
that wasn't trialed on Catapo. <laughs> it was um, trialed on, um, I think it's a, um, a South African or Australian sort of relative of, of, of the Catapo, and right. the, the problem that, that lives in that same. Yeah, environment. yeah, and yeah. the and the problem was um, w- w- was um, was it was an additive. Um, so in that in that situation, you, you know, you've got to get get smart, get good advice, um, yeah. or not just get good advice, sort of um, try things. Um, and sometimes you you've got to try things. For, um, over a period of time to, to get it right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's the issue of um, aerial spraying over plants that you don't want to um, lose, you know. So yeah. we have covered a lot of plants up out there, which um, on, on, the, on the face of it might seem a bit knotty, but um, you know, you've, you've, you've only got that sort of um, area out there to sort of um, to protect. So you don't really want to just be Really casual about it, no. uh, but by the same token, you you can't uh, you can't save everything. You've got to as, as a work colleague down south says, you've got to you know break eggs to make omelets. So yeah, yeah, and that's the reality of a lot of conservation work. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. And is it because it's such a unique environment out there? Do you need to sort of specialise some of the application techniques and the ways that yeah. you carry out? Yeah, you do. Well, when um, when the marum grass first started get, um, getting controlled, um, there was a, a product on the market that um, you could spray the marum grass uh, with the herb. It was a selective herbicide. It would only kill the marum grass. It wouldn't kill any um, broader-leaved plant, but more importantly, it wouldn't kill the pea um, That's actually classified as a sedge um, in the plant world, and the herbicide didn't affect that at all. Which was, you know, if it had. It, um, it would have been probably too much damage. So yeah. that that was that's a very fortunate thing that marum is, is, is a grass. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, we use different herbicides out there um, depending on the on the on the situation. And also, like I say, there's there's been plenty of times when you just um, actually sort of pulling plants out, particularly in yeah. isolated areas. You know, you don't go pulling acres of lupin out by hand. Yeah. It's not like the Chinese who haven't got access to 3,000 people when a when a <laughs> lake gets um, full yeah. of weed. Um, so you've got to be practical about it. Um, and I guess that's when those community groups are really a huge help. Oh, listen, and the people, um, you know, there's people who sort of come across sort of weeds. We don't say that, we don't think or say that we know where everything is out there, you know. We always say to people, listen, if you see something that looks a bit different or, you know, if you see lupin that's just in the middle of nowhere, just give us a yell and, yeah. and, and people do report that sort of thing and then you follow it up and sometimes it's, um, that's fantastic because it's just... Um, you got to, you need as many pair of eyes as you can. Mm. Yeah. Is part of that an education for the local community, sort of what plants they shouldn't put in their gardens because they're likely um, to escape? Well, there was a, a, a few people in the local community oh, well, a few years ago now. They they put out a, a brochure about um, um, plants that had were, were causing sort of problems and es- escaping and were, were getting away, and they sort of put, you know gave some alternatives. Um, and you, people always, you always got to give people alternatives. You can't just say no, you can't have that, and not yeah. give them something else to, you know, replace. Yeah. It. And they might not take that advice. But um, the thing is, is just to have the information out there. But you know, it's it's the same thing. Um, you know, I've never gardened out there, and um, I reckon it'd be it'd be, it'd be very challenging. Tough, yeah. yeah, and um, that's why um, some of the plants that are planted out there, that people will continue planting them as long as they, you know. Um, Allowed to in the sense that they can still buy them from garden centres or yeah, propagate sure. them or that sort of carry on. Yeah. Um, they'll 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 continue to plant those, particularly the shelter plants, because yeah. um, yeah. you, you 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 do need some shelter out there um, if you want to grow some veggies and food and um, a bit of shelter for the kids or something. Um, um, yeah, but just the old I don't know. There's an old no, I'm saying it's an old approach, but just you got to you can't go in there with a stick. You know, it's um, people have had a had enough of that sort of carry on, and um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, know, you, um, you just you got to work, got to work with people. Work together. Yeah. 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 Mm. Oh, so is there anything else important that we need to know about? Um, well, yeah. Yeah, I guess um, a problem in some of the dunes is um, on the public conservation land um, is for um, four wheel drive and two wheel two-wheel motorbikes um, going through the middle of the dunes. I mean, people are allowed to take sort of vehicles and um, and bikes onto the, onto the beach, um, 
but through the dunes, you know, it's not, it's certainly not encouraged at all. Um, and there are no restrictions. Well, there's, 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 yeah, it's a good question. I mean, there are some restrictions in the sense that there's, there's, there's fences at strategic points, but you can't fence the whole area off, right. and yeah. people do have a right to have access to the beach. Um, so the one of the, I think it's one of the four-wheel drive clubs. They um, down on the car parks, they put up a sign saying, um, you know, um, along the lines of um, just go easy on the beach and on the dunes. You know, yeah. don't don't go on the dunes, otherwise yeah. we, we will lose the ability to sort of get access. It was basically exhorting yeah. their, you know, people with vehicles not to sort of go through the dunes. Um, bikes is maybe a little bit different. Um, mountain bikes? No. Um, um, ATVs, but also okay. um, you know four-wheel bikes, but also yeah. two-wheel sort of bikes, sort of like pretty swish performance sort of bikes right. uh, going through the dunes, okay. um, and that damages a lot of vegetation. There's some um, highly endangered plants out there. Um, maybe when, you know when you're on a bike, you you don't see them or you, you you're not aware of them. Yeah. Maybe the, I mean uh, maybe the department, um, maybe we need to put more effort into um, telling people what's out there with yeah, signage true. and what have you, but. I mean, not everyone is going to care about, you know, a woolly head crash beady that's, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but if populations of those plants sort of got damaged further, then, you know, who knows? Um, and I suppose, like you said, that area is becoming more popular. Yeah. For people to live and for recreation. Yeah. So it's yeah. And you know, it's you know, people have um, recreated, you know, where they've wanted, generally in New Zealand, and there's. Yeah. I guess people feel there's more and more restrictions being put on. Um, it's a sort of a balance, really, between not not losing everything and um, still allowing people to um, do what they've not always done, but done to some degree. Yeah. Oh, well, it sounds like you're making progress, definitely. Mm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, every time you go out there, you do. Um, you know, you 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 learn some learn from some mistakes and. Um, but the the main thing is is um, just getting people on board, um, just enjoying what you do out there. Because um, mm. if you don't enjoy it, there's uh, there's no point going out there. No. Um, yeah, it's 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 a great spot, and you know there's some people who are concerned about it becoming more popular. Um, but there's only so many people perhaps who are going to um, be turned on by a 30 k bit of gravel. That's <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's not everyone's cup of tea, but um, <laughs> it's a great spot. And Canterbury's uh, you know, really, lo- well, not lucky to have it, but it's just a fantastic part of Canterbury yeah. that's um, sometimes overlooked. Yeah. Um, it's a real, particularly in winter, it's, it's um, the orange hue of the peak house, just really gorgeous. Um, it's a fantastic place, yeah. Mm. Oh, thank you, Ian. Okay, that's, that's all right. very interesting. Great, thank you. <laughs>